Amen. Thank you, choir. It's now time for our children ages 4 through 8 to be dismissed to Children's Church. Children ages 4 through 8, this is your opportunity for separate activities for your age group. Children ages 4 through 8. While they're making their way downstairs, I invite you to find in your Bibles Matthew chapter 6 as we look at verses 19 through 24 today. And while you're finding that passage of Scripture, I want to take a moment of personal privilege and say, way to go, North Central High School Knights. Victory! Victory! I was getting ready to say that. Barry's pointing at him, starting quarterback. Tyler Falconberry, stand up, my man. Good job, brother. Good job. Amen. We're proud of y'all. Looking forward to a good season. Uh, AJ, how'd y'all do? I hadn't heard. Okay, ne never mind. Okay, we'll edit that out of the tape. Yeah, you know, edit that out of the tape today. But uh, maybe AJ will have a better season than what they began with. But we preach. It takes hard work, doesn't it, guys? Anybody else on the team in our church? Anybody else? Now, all right. It's Tyler, you represent us well, brother. Represent Christ on that field. All right, today, as we uh, go into a continuation of our series on the, uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 24, as I mentioned a moment ago. And we're talking about treasures and temptations. And uh, obviously by the screenshot you see there, a lot of what we're going to talk about is money and wealth and possessions and that type of thing. And the mindset we have about that and how that can become, if we're not careful, a controlling factor in our hearts, in our mindset, in our lives. And one illustration of this, which I found to be fascinating, to be honest with you, didn't have to do with uh, men and women of, of earning potential, didn't have to do with teenagers, it had to do with smaller children. And in a study that was included in the archives of pediatrics and adolescent medicine, and I'm not sure when this study was conducted, but what hadn't been that long ago, I do not believe. But uh, children were, were given a choice to, uh, between foods. And it's not like they were given a choice between hamburgers and spinach, or chicken nuggets and broccoli. They were given a choice between hamburgers and hamburgers or chicken nuggets and chicken nuggets, or something along that line, uh, french fries and french fries. And what the study found was that although the food items were identical, prepared by the same people, on the same day, at the same time, using the same ingredients, the children overwhelmingly said that the items that they got that were wrapped in these kind of wrappers were better than the others. And in fact, in that same study, these psychologists or whoever they were even took some chicken nuggets and french fries that did not come from McDonald's and put those in McDonald's wrappings and the kids say, these taste better. These taste better. And I thought that was a fascinating study. It kind of goes into the mindset, even early on in, in our culture, about how we instill this mindset for labeling and branding, etc. We do the same thing, obviously, as kids. Uh, uh, for instance, for instance, some of you may have a particular brand that you associate would rather identify with. As, as an example, I have a relative who is not made of means, does not have a huge financial account to lean on, but this relative insists on wearing nothing but, well, shirt-wise, nothing but Ralph Lauren shirts. Now, I don't know about y'all, if y'all got some Ralph Lauren shirts in your closet, God bless you. I don't. Because when I go and pick out a Ralph Lauren shirt, and I look at the price on that thing, what do I do? I put it back on the rack and back away from it. You know, I go to the clearance rack at Belk's and get an amen in the house. You know, and, and, and I don't care what the brand is, if it fits, if it looks pretty, if it's a decent color, not orange, I will wear the thing. I will wear the thing. 
Okay, we're tra- training. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, stop, we'll get away from politics in there for a second. You know, but, but he, this particular individual, he, he insists on that. I know somebody else that insists on wearing Nike sports apparel. It has to be Nike. It can't be Converse. It can't be Adidas. It can't be Under Armour. It has to be Nike. That's the one they choose to identify with. I don't know, uh, Air Apostles, is that still a big thing with teenagers? Some of you shaking heads, no. I don't know what the, the cooling thing is. At one time it was Go Navy. Well, that's not it. Old Navy. Old Navy. <laughs> the old Navy. I need to do my research a little bit better in preparation, I believe. But, but you get the point. We, we tend to identify with something. We want to wrap ourselves in a brand or something uh, like that. From an early age, I want to read uh, this article out of this blog that referenced that study. It says, from an early age and on through adulthood, branding is directive in telling us what we think and feel, who we are, what we love. What matters? In the same way, how often are we as adults blindsided by mere wrappings? The images that shape our affections. Is the mistake of a child in believing the food tastes better if it's wrapped in a yellow McDonald's wrapper really any different from our own believing we are better people dressed with the right clothing or the right credentials? covered by the latest fashion, whatever it might be. And to some degree or another, we've got to admit, that's certainly true in American culture. And for some degree or another, it may be true in your life. And today I want to examine that thing. When it comes to how we identify ourselves, what is it to us that matters? What are the things that, that speak to our heart issues? And is our heart driven by the things of Christ or is it driven by the things of of the world. So with that, let's turn to our focal passage. We examine this topic, treasures and temptation. Our focal passage again is Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, reading through verse 24. I want to ask if you're willing and able to rise with me as we honor the, the public reading of God's Word today. These are the words of Christ recorded for us in the first gospel of the New Testament. Here in this eternal and errant infallible Word of God, the words of Christ, beginning in verse 19 of Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading and hearing of His Word. You may be seated. This morning I have three points I've derived from this passage of Scripture. These points are included in an outline within the context of your bullet. I would encourage you to take notes. There will certainly be some fill-in-the-blanks that are prompted for you on the screen. But also, for the guests that are here and others, if you see something in Scripture you feel like you need to examine further, or if God's speaking to you in any way, write it down. Write it down. It's something for you to pray over and to contemplate as you engage in your personal spiritual discipline of Bible study and prayer this coming week. But point number one is this. Too often, we are guilty of dividing life into the spiritual and the material. Too often, we're guilty, in li- in too, we're guilty of dividing life into the spiritual things of life and the material things of life. When in fact, there should be no division at all. In a series of articles on the nature of greed, Christian blogger Ted Schofield writes these words. I'll read for you what he wrote on his his blog. He says, when I ask people the question, the question being, what is greed? Typically, the first concept articulated involves the notion of abundance. 
Most people will answer the question about what is greed by saying something along the lines of greed is when you have too much stuff which only money can buy. Or place too much importance on stuff. Or spend too much time pursuing or wanting or envying stuff. That's what a lot of people equate with greed. A college student told the blogger this, he said, when people are sleeping on the street and you have a Mercedes and four empty bedrooms in your McMansion, then you are greedy. Perhaps so. How many of y'all remember George Carlin? It's a little vulgar, but he had some great points at times. He, he died a few years back. But uh, George Carlin might agree with that. He said this. Now, I'll quote George Carlin. He says, that's the whole meaning of life, isn't it? Trying to find a place for your stuff. That's all your house is. A place to keep your stuff. While you go out and get more stuff. Sometimes you've got to move. You've got to, bigger, you've got to get a bigger house. Why? You have too much stuff. Got to get an amen in the house. Realtors in the room. You appreciate that, don't you? You appreciate that. We need to go and get a bigger house. And sure enough, we Americans are not filling our houses with people. With people. In 1950, the average home size in America was 983 square feet. And 3.37 people on average lived in that 983 square foot home. By the year 2009, the average home's square footage has ballooned to 2,700 with fewer occupants, only 2.57 occupants in the house. So in 59 years, the average American home grew by 175% while the average family size shrunk by 24%. So to repeat line or point number one, too often we are guilty of dividing life into the spiritual and the material. The spiritual and the material. But Jesus made no such distinctions. None whatsoever. In fact, in many of His parables, Jesus made it clear that our attitude towards wealth and possessions was a telling trait about our spiritual mindset and our heart condition. Am I right? One parable is found in the Gospel of Luke. Turn over there, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, if you have trouble finding it. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. This is one of the parables of Christ. He, uh, he spoke this parable in a, as a response to a question was given to him. Or a problem is posed to him. Beginning verse 13, he says, this is Luke chapter 12, beginning verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then Jesus said, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even... When one has an abundance, does his life consist of his possessions? And then he told this, this parable. He says, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you've prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus makes no distinction between our spiritual lives in our material possessions. Because one will drive the other. One will drive the other. Life cannot be divided between the spiritual and the material. Our attitude again towards the one drives our attitude towards the other. Can anybody give me an amen? Okay. Point number two. And this is a quote from Warren Wiersbe out of his commentary on the book of Matthew. 
Warren says, it is not wrong to possess things, but it is wrong for them to possess us. It is not wrong for us to possess things, but it is wrong for them to possess us. See if anybody can identify with this little story. One day, a man came home from work. He sat down to pay his bills. When he was finished, he laid down the checkbook and said to his wife, he said, honey, we can stop fighting about money because we don't have any left to fight over. How many of you remember the Y2K, Y2K scare? Some of y'all? A few of you? Okay. For those of you not of a particular age to remember that, the Y2K scare uh, was back when the calendar year was approaching the year 2000. And the concern was that the old computer programs would not be able to recognize that. A lot of the old computer programs are based on a two-digit year code system versus a four-digit. So the fear was that such things as financial records and everything else would revert back to the year 1900 as opposed to moving forward to 2000 and that the computers couldn't handle that. And that's to put it in a nutshell, this, uh, that's a non technical, non-educated non, uh, way of explaining what that was, but I do remember it, the industry I worked at at the time, a steel mill in Charlotte, North Carolina, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars upgrading our computer systems to prevent the computer systems from crashing when we reached January 1st, 2000. A lot of people put a lot of energy, a lot of corporations spent millions of dollars preparing for that. A lot of people at home went into a lot of anxiety over that. A lot of people were taking drastic measures fearing that the world around us would, would almost collapse with our computers not working. And uh, there's a lot of anxiety during that time period. Here's a true story from that period. A man from Florence, Italy, by the name of and uh, Andrea Scanta, Scancarella, something like that, some Italian name, 29 years old, was not going to take any chances on the Y2K problem. Uh, again, he's from Italy, and he went to his bank just three days before the turn of the year from December of 1999 to January of 2000, and he withdrew all of his savings. He did not want the bank to lose track of his money and for him to lose his savings, which he had accumulated, and so he decided to take it all out bring it home with him in cash, and he would avoid the Y2K problems. The problem was, just a few moments after he withdrew all of his cash, $5,730 equivalent American, he, he was looking in a storefront window, holding his bag of cash, and you guessed it, a robber came by and snagged that bag out of his hand. He lost all of his savings. Not to a computer program, but to his fear of what would happen. His fear of what would happen. Uh, look, look again back at our, our focal passage, verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. And then why does he say that? Because the treasures on earth, something will happen. What is it? It could all go away. Moth could, 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 could take it away. Rust could destroy it. Thieves could break in and steal it. He says, if you put your hope and your trust in earthly possessions, in money, in a big bank account, into a large home, nice car, good clothes, whatever it might be, says, that's not going to last. It's not going to last. In fact, it's wrong to possess them. I love that quote from Warren Wiersbe. It's not wrong to possess things, but it is wrong for them to possess us. It is wrong for them to possess us. Here's, here's more out of his commentary. It's called Be Loyal. It's a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. Warren Risby writes these words. He says, Jesus made it clear that a right attitude towards wealth is a mark of true spirituality. If we have the true righteousness of Christ in our lives, then we will have a proper attitude toward material wealth. He goes on to say that nowhere in the Bible did Jesus magnify poverty or criticize the legitimate gaining of wealth. God made all things, amen? Including food, clothing, and precious metals. 
God has declared that all things that He made are good. And God knows that we need certain things in order to live. In fact, 1 Timothy 6.17 tells us that God has given us richly all things to enjoy. It's not wrong to possess things, but it is wrong for the things to possess us. The sin of idolatry is as dangerous as the sin of hypocrisy. Let me say it again. The sin of idolatry is as dangerous as the sin of of hypocrisy. We turn back to another biblical author. Solomon wrote these words in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Solomon writes, and Solomon was known as the wisest man other than Christ ever to walk the earth. He writes, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. Now Solomon could speak here with experience. Not only in his day was he the wisest man in the world, but what else was he? The richest man in the world. He had everything that you could dream of. Everything that that he desired under the sun, he had. Wealth, prosperity, power, abundance. He had it all. He had it all. But he says, that's not enough. These things do not bring joy. These things do not bring happiness. In fact, if I tie myself up too closely in loving my things, there's no joy at all. Jesus Himself warned against the sin of living for the things of this life. He pointed out the sad consequences of of coveting somebody else's wealth. The sad consequences of materialism. Of idolatry, that brings us to the final point. Point number three is, Jesus equates covetousness with enslavement. Enslavement. You can see that back in our focal passage, Matthew chapter 6. Verse 24 where he says, No one can serve two masters. Two masters. He's using that that illustration of, of being enslaved to another. Materialism, he says, enslaves the heart. It enslaves the heart. He says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now again, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with accumulating wealth. There's nothing wrong, per se, with with gaining more fortune. I don't know about y'all, but I'd love some more fortune, amen? If God was to bless me with wealth, I'm not going to say, God, no thanks. No thanks. You know, if God was to bless me with with a, 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 a huge bank account, praise the Lord. But it's only praiseworthy if that does not turn my heart toward materialism. If, if, if having more money becomes my God, per se, my aim in life, my desire in life, my chief occupation in life, my heart's become enslaved to wealth, materialism, branding, having the right clothing, having the right car, having the right house in the right neighborhood. Letting the world see how much I have done and what I have accumulated. Oh, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. If you look at somebody like that's a sad caricature of what a man should be. Our heart should be toward the Lord, not towards, not towards possessions, money, power. 
Materialism not only enslaves the heart, it also enslaves the mind. It enslaves the mind. Because what is in the heart, if you have a desire for, for something, if, you, if your heart has this, this, this craving for more and more and more, or to, to acquire a, a certain uh, uh, home or, or car or whatever it is, and, and you start to crave that in your heart, what's going to happen? Your mind's going to think about it all the time, is it not? Because your heart d- drives what's in the mind. And when you start to think about something and, and desiring something, you're, you're crowding your mind with the things of this world and going away from the things of Christ. Going away from what you should be focused on as Christ. So materialism enslaves the heart. It enslaves the mind because now the heart is driving the mind. And the mind is thinking about and, and striving for and, and plotting and all this other stuff. To, to gain the wealth that the heart desires. And when that occurs, it also enslaves the will. It enslaves the will. Once the heart is captured, the mind soon follows, and then the will is right after that. It enslaves the will. And it destroys a person from the inside. Now again... There is nothing wrong with accumulating wealth if it doesn't corrupt your heart, your mind, and your will. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong. In fact, I hope many of you reap some kind of a huge fortune. That'd be wonderful. I'd praise God with you. I will, of course, ask you to tithe on that. Return to God what is God's. There's nothing wrong with gaining wealth as long as it doesn't capture you. As long as it doesn't enslave you. give you an example. This is a closing illustration here. Randy Alcorn, you've heard of him. He's a Christian author. Written several books. And uh, one of his blogs, he wrote this fairly recently actually. He says, suppose you buy shares of General Motors. First of all, I don't know why you'd buy that. Ford is much better. But I'm just quoting him. Suppose you buy shares of General Motors. What happens? Well, you suddenly develop interest in GM. You check the financial pages. You see a magazine article about GM and you read every word even though a month ago you've, you would have passed right over it. Suppose you're giving to help African children with AIDS. When you see an article on the subject, you're hooked. If you're sending money to plant churches in India, and an earthquake hits India, you watch the news and you fervently pray. He's right, isn't he? We invest ourselves in something that captures us. It captures us. And he goes on to say, do you wish you cared more about eternal things? Do you wish you cared more about eternal things? If so, then reallocate some of your money. He says maybe even most of your money from temporal things to eternal things. Put your resources, your assets, your money, your possessions, your time, your talents, your energies into the things of God. And watch what happens. As surely as the compass needle follows north, your heart will follow your treasure. Amen? Point number one. Too often we are guilty of dividing life into the spiritual and the material. Point number two, it is not wrong to possess things, but it is wrong for them to possess us. Point number three, Jesus equates covetous, covetousness, coveting, I can write the word, I just can't say it. Jesus equates coveting other stuff with enslavement. Materialism not only enslaves the heart, It also enslaves the mind. 
and enslaves the will. So this morning, I want you to think about that. Are there any areas in your life where this passage speaks to today? Is there something going on in your personal plans, your financial strategies, or whatever, that runs afoul of what Jesus tells us about in Matthew chapter 6? Have you found yourself where you, you've been very successful and you have perhaps accumulated much wealth, but then you realize, like Solomon did, that this didn't really accomplish anything? It's going to pass in a moment's notice. None of this will gain me anything eternal. Perhaps you're struggling financially. I assume there's more people in this room that have financial difficulties than there are who have financial wealth. Don't get me wrong, this passage is not just about the wealthy. Those of us who are poor, with small bank accounts and big bills to pay, it still speaks to us. Because wealth can be an idol to us even if we don't have it. The desire for more. Is that overruling your desire for the things of Christ? Your desire for the better job, the higher paying salary, so that you can have the better clothes, better car, better home. Eat at the finer restaurants. If that is your goal, you're still guilty of idolatry. You're still guilty of materialism, even if you don't have any right now. Bottom line is this. Is our love for God and love for Christ bigger than our love for money? And if it's not, something is wrong. And you need to fix it now. You need to fix it today. So today, if you're guilty in any way of that regard, I plead with you to get your face before God and get things right. What's in your heart will drive what's in your mind, which will drive your will and desires. That's what we need to be at. In that righteous relationship with Christ, so the things of the Lord fill my heart, fill my mind, and dictate my will. Amen? Father God, this day, help us as we close this service and wrestle with these truths. Help us, O oh God, to make the decisions that are glorifying to You. Father, someone in this room today, probably more than just one, probably several, if not many, who struggle with this issue, Myself included, Father, I must confess. Many of us get caught up in desiring the things that it's not important. It's not important. Not in the long run, not in the eternal. So Father, cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, cleanse my will of all the things that will distract me from Your good and perfect will. Help us to make decisions today, O oh Lord, to get us right back on the right track where we need to be with You. Father, others in this room, perhaps they're contemplating where they should serve, what church they should be a part of, Scripture says, Father, that we should not forsake the gathering together of the assembly and that we're all part of one body working together, serving together, ministering together. So, Father, I pray that those who have not identified with this church 
And if they don't have a church family they call home, oh Lord, let this be the church they'll choose. And Father, others in this room, I know, are wrestling with the decision, do I accept Christ now or can I put that off? Can I just wait a while? I'm having too much fun now. I'm too young now. I've got many other priorities in my life. Father, help them to come to a right realization that You love them so much and died for them, O oh Lord. Help them realize the magnitude of Your love and let them respond today with faith in Jesus. Father, help each of us to get our priorities where they need to be. Whatever adjustments we need to make in our lives. May today be the day those decisions are made. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand and sing this hymn of invitation. If you have a